thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation out to Brussels. It's sort of been a really interesting uh, day so far. And uh, what I want to talk about really is molecular quality control. Uh, as we become older, molecular quality control decreases and that leads to aging and age-related diseases. And, um, and so as, as quality control decreases, this leads to a propensity to age and to age-related diseases. And one quality control mechanism that becomes defective with time is protein homeostasis. Protein homeostasis, or protein quality control, is really important in order to generate and maintain the functional proteome. And that includes uh, protein biogenesis, protein modification, and well, as well as the management of protein aggregation and degradation. And all of this is necessary to keep all the proteins that basically fulfill most of the cellular functions uh, functional. Also, uh, protein homeostasis has been shown to be a very early event to fail during aging. And so consistent with this, a number of age-related diseases are linked to a failure in protein homeostasis and this includes neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and Huntington's disease of which we've already heard today. Now, what, what we realize is that from, from knowledge in very simple model organisms up to higher organisms that longevity is oftentimes related and linked to improve protein homeostasis. And we wanted to know if improving protein homeostasis might actually be sufficient to extend lifespan. So really, going into this, we asked a very simple question. Is it possible to improve protein homeostasis or improve protein quality control? And is that sufficient to extend lifespan by itself? And to do that, we turned to a very simple model organism uh, C. elegans. It's a very small nematode. It's actually a microscopic organism. It's just about a millimeter in size when it's an adult. But it's really fantastic for aging research because, first of all, the genetics have been very well understood. The, ge the, ge the genome is completely sequenced. Uh, actually, animals lay about 300 eggs, which then develop within about three days at room temperature uh, to a fully full adult. And also, we can do survival demographics with these very easily because they only live for about three weeks. They're really fantastic for aging research and have been a great tool. To do this project, we particularly focused on the endoplasmic reticulum. The reason is that the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER, is the site for synthesis of and folding for all extracellular and membrane proteins. So it's a site of major challenges to protein homeostasis. And just to get you up to speed to uh, ER physiology, uh, proteins are actually imported into the ER lumen co-translationally, where they then depend on the activity of chaperones, energy, disulfide bond formation, and importantly, N-glycosylation, or post-translation or modification, to reach their fully folded states. And these uh, folded, properly folded proteins are then shipped off to their target destinations. However, all the proteins are in an equilibrium with misfolded proteins, and the accumulation of misfolded proteins triggers the unfolded protein response, which is a signaling cascade that leads to changes in nuclear gene expression that then counter translation rate and improves chaperone uh, expression, for example. Also, uh, misfolded proteins are degraded via the ER-associated degradation pathway, in which proteins are retrotranslocated into the cytoplasm and then degraded by the proteasome. Now, what we wanted to do is to improve protein homeostasis in an unbiased way, so we wanted to do a forward genetic screen in, G in, in C. elegans. And we did this by posing a, posing a challenge to these animals. And this challenge is, was a drug, a drug called tunicamycin. And tunicamycin inhibits the uh, formation of these N-glycosylation precursors. So we inhibit N-glycosylation, use a massive, e, uh, use, <coughs> triggering massive ER stress, and this is really toxic to animals, and this is also a process that um, then uh, doesn't allow them to complete their development. And so this is the design of the forward genetic screen. We used chemical mutagenesis, and then one generation removed used uh, tunicamycin selection. And this is what the screen really looked like. So it was really a black and white kind of result. So wild type animals or mutants that are not resistant actually were never able to develop. However, we selected those mutants that are able to not only complete development, but also uh, give rise to new generations, so they're actually fertile on tunicamycin. And then we analyzed these animals using next-generation sequencing to identify the gene mutations that are causal for this, for 
this resistance. And one gene that we focused on early is called glutamine fructose 6-phosphate aminotransferase. And why would that be an interesting gene? Well, actually there are a number of reasons. First, we found three independent single amino acid substitutions which are linked to the tunicomycin resistance. Also, GFAT1 had never been uh, associated with aging before, and so we decided to work on that. And what GFAT1 does is it is the key enzyme of the hexosamine pathway. And the hexosamine pathway is a metabolic pathway that uses fructose 6-phosphate from glycolysis and then in an anabolic process builds up udp n glucosamine or short udp glycanac And udp glycanac is then a precursor together with dolichol phosphate in the synthesis of N-linked glycans. And this kind of caught our attention because this is exactly the process which is inhibited by tunicomycin. So in, in the world of screening, this is sort of what you get, right? You, you get what you, what you screen for. And particularly what happened is that what we thought is that GFAT might actually be activated. This might increase UDP glycanac levels to then counter the tunicomycin toxicity. And we tested that uh, using a number of methods. This is the biochemical approach. And what we found uh, using liquid chromatography in mass spec uh, is that UDP glycanac levels were massively increased in all three GFAT mutations that we have. And this is both during development and in the adulthood of these animals. So we concluded from that that the GFAT1 mutations that we had were gain-of-function mutations, which is kind of sort of unexpected in mutagenesis screen. Uh, and, but though, however, consistent with the single amino acid substitutions that we observed. So at this point, this was kind of nice, but not too interesting, right? I mean, we basically get an elevation of UDP glycanac that counters tunicomycin, and we get resistance. However, what was interesting was that these GFAT gain of function mutants were also long lived. So, here are, here are survival demographics for the three independent GFAT gain of function mutations, and all of them showed a lifespan extension. And then, to further actually test that, we wanted to know whether supplementation with the precursor of the hexosamine pathway might have the same effect in wild type animals. And this is actually true. So, these are all wild type animals, so they're actually genetically identical. And compared to an untreated control or a control here in green with the osmolarity, which is basically just treated with an osmolarity control, a glicknac treatment actually extends lifespan uh, of C. elegans. So we really wanted to understand how in detail how this worked, and I'm just going to really run through these data very quickly here. Basically, we found that indeed uh, the hexosamine pathway was activated in these animals we found that overexpression of GFAT had the, same, had the same effect. We also realized that none of the known long longevity pathways signals through this hexosamine pathway, suggesting that it's really a new pathway. And we found that uh, protein quality control was improved and we have reduced aggregation in the, uh, in the ER. And aggregation in the ER has previously been described and a number of uh, mechanisms are known that actually counter protein aggregation in the ER. These include the unfolded protein response, ERAD, and also autophagy. And so we then basically went through this and systematically tested which of these processes might be involved. And we found that the unfolded protein response is actually not activated. So we don't have a, a continuous firing through the UPR, but there's really no transcriptional changes at le that level. However, we have an activation of ERAD and also of proteasome activity, and also autophagy was increased. And this kind of made us think because proteasome activity and, and the autophagy pathway are not only responsible for clearing aggregates from the ER, but they're really uh, proteolytic processes that are important for all compartments. And so we wondered if we might actually have improvements in toxic protein expression also in uh, compartments outside the ER. And we tested this in a number of models, and I'm only showing one example here. This is a transgenic worm which expresses a polyglutamine stretch um, in the muscle specifically. And polyglutamine expansions are, among others, uh, involved in the etiology of Huntington's disease. And so we can actually look at the toxicity of these polyglutamine stretches in the motility of these animals because it's expressed in the muscle. So it's not neurodegeneration really, but it's proteotoxicity assays. And what I'm comparing here is the arginine treatment with glycnac treatment again. And after 10 days, 
these move, this worm is actually moving, but it's actually highly par highly paralyzed. So this polyglutamine stretch is really toxic to uh, to these cells. However, when we treat animals for the same amount of time with lignac, we have some significantly conserved motility. And we also, of course, quantified this in these, in these motility assays and found that compared to water or D-arginine, you know, osmolarity control, glicnac or UDP glicnac significantly uh, enhanced uh, motility in this, in this assay. And we also found this to be true, for example, for worms that express a beta and a model for Alzheimer's disease. All right, so with this, I will just summarize really briefly what we found. So we identified the hexosamine pathway as a novel um, act as a novel longevity pathway, which can be activated through either genetic gain of function uh, in the key enzyme GFAT1, or uh, through simply uh, feeding glycnac to these animals. This enhances UDP glycnac levels to then activate a number of protein quality control mechanisms, including autophagy, ERA and the proteasome, and together these mechanisms counter toxic protein aggregation and extend lifespan. With this, I'll end. I just want to thank my uh, great collaborator, Nadia Storm, who's worked with me on this project uh, over the time, and my mentor, um, Adam Antebi. We all work at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging, and uh, this is my funding. And just before I end, I just want to mentioned that I'm starting my own lab now at our great institute. So I'll be sitting right down here from now on, uh, starting my own lab, and we'll do further work on protein quality control in C. elegans. But I'm really most excited about testing the, the role of the hexosamine pathway in mammalian aging. So we're going to, to look into that and there's some first interesting data in that regard. So let me thank again for being invited, and thanks you, thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe one question. No? Nobody? Okay. You mentioned that your gain of function mutation is actually protective uh, uh, for animals that express uh, polyglutamine uh, yes. things. Do you think that, uh, or do you know if anybody has checked uh, if uh, um, the G-fat uh, function uh, in one type uh, humans, for example, it goes down with aging uh, in such a way that it can uh, stop to protect the, the human being from uh, uh, developing uh, Huntington disease. And this might may be one of the reasons why it takes so long to develop a disease. Yeah, that's, that's a really important question, and, and um, we didn't do that yet, and I'm not aware of any data that show that, but we kind of did the experiment in a small scale and looked at worms, <laughs> so, which is what we like to do. So we basically looked at, at an aging curve in worms and just took samples at different time points, and we see that the UDP glycnac levels actually go down with, uh, with age, and in that, that also occurs actually in our mutants. However, even at old age, they still have higher levels than, than the wild types. So it seems that it's a, some, uh, that it's a phenotype that changes with age, but we're looking and we would be really interested in looking at humans as well. <laughs>